This is a very important moment in Earth's history. You and I are here on planet Earth as it is beginning its circle again around the sun. We celebrate Christmas at a time when we are glad to see that the days are getting longer. I know these things. Some of you know these things. But let us rejoice and be glad that God has given us life. Some for over 90 years. Some for just a few days, it seems. So when I was thinking about what we could talk about together on this day, I was reading in Exodus. Last week, we talked about God and His desires for what He wants to do for us this year, what He has promised to do for us this year. That was last week. So we, we kind of turned the tables last week, but this week we're turning them back again. And, you know, here it is. July 5. July? You sure it's not July yet? Oh my goodness. Here I thought the year was already half. Yeah, just, just, just make sure I'm okay. Must have been those cold medications. Okay. January 5. I want to give a shout out to my brother who had a birthday yesterday. And for all of those who have turned another year old, congratulations. We're here at this at this beginning juncture and now it's our turn to check ourselves for what it is that we are going to promise. And that is, that is something that caught my attention here in Exodus. If you want to turn in your Bible, if you look in the pew in front of you, there might be a Bible there. Turn to Exodus chapter 32 and you will see that you have a situation going on. You know how we like to say when we don't really want to describe things too detailed, we just say it was a, it was a situation. Okay? The situation was that Moses had been up on the mountain talking to God and he had been away for a very long time. He'd been talking to God because God was now going to make a promise to his people and his people were going to make a promise to him. So this, you can see, is why this kind of caught my attention as, as I'm thinking about the time of year that this is and, and the promises that we are going to make to ourselves and to other people. Moses is there. He's, he's not really thinking about the people down below, but they have been thinking about him and they are now getting antsy and so they come to his brother, <clears throat> Moses' brother, Aaron, and they say to him, we don't know what's happened to this guy. He's been gone a long time. Give us a God that we can worship. I don't know what thought process came into Aaron's head at that point. But I know that as a father... There have been times when I have seen things happening with my children and as a pastor there are things that I have seen that have been happening with various congregations where I have served and moments like this happen where the, the people in your life lose connection with God and they come to you for leadership and guidance and at that moment and particularly thinking of myself as a parent, you ask them to do something that ends up just not turning out very well. I like, I like how Aaron tells it to Moses later on in chapter 32. He says, uh, I told them to bring me their bangles and their earrings of gold. Bear in mind, the Egyptians had given these things to the Israelites when they left 
The Egyptians were only too eager to see the Israelites leave, and this had only been a few weeks earlier. And so here the Israelites were wearing lots of things that the Egyptians had given them. And so Aaron says, take your earrings off, take your bangles off, and give them to me. And he took them. And I love how he talks to his brother later on, how he retells the story. He says, I threw them into the fire and out jumped a calf. Don't you think that was the best way to tell the story? I, I think that was so cool. I mean, if, if this was my younger but more important brother and I was trying to impress him with my, you know, my, my special magic skills, this would be the way that I would tell the story. It really wasn't the way that it happened. You know, it, it was his spin on the situation, trying to, to not be <coughs> thrown under the bus that he knew was coming and that, that Moses was bringing. And, and, and he's saying, look, I, I threw them into the fire and out jumped a calf and they decided to worship it. Now, why was it a calf? Well, we know from both Egypt and also Canaan that the calf was a symbol of Baal, or Baal, the sun god. And that the people of Canaan, where the Israelites were going, had been told, they had been given strict instructions, by God, I, I don't want you to worship other gods, I don't want you to worship the gods of the Canaanites. But you see, the gods of the Canaanites were similar to the gods of Egypt that the people of Israel were very familiar with. They had been living in this land of Egypt for over 400 years. And if you count, I don't know, uh, a generation maybe is, is 50, 60 years in those days. I mean, we are talking about slaves here who were having to work hard and then harder before they were brought out of slavery. I don't know how long they lasted, but let's just say that 400 years is eight generations that had been worshiping or had been exposed to the same kinds of gods that they are now headed towards and have been told you must not worship these. They don't know any different. So you could say, and, and, and this is me as a parent maybe thinking that if my children were to do this, I would be thinking, well, how do I kind of let them off? Well, the way that we kind of let ourselves off sometimes is by saying, you know, they didn't know any different. They didn't know any better. But then I have to go back just a few pages in my Bible, and what do I see? I see that the children of Israel had just crossed the Red Sea on dry land. They had just come out of Egypt where God had perpetrated ten plagues of disaster upon the country of Egypt where they themselves had not experienced those plagues. There was like a curtain between the Israelites and the, and the Egyptians. This is, this is not ancient history for them. This is just the other day. And because Moses has now been up on the mountain for, yea, these 40 days, they get impatient. And they come to, to the weaker brother, maybe. You ever heard Paul talking about that? The weaker brother says, give me your bangles and your earrings. And he made them a golden calf. Moses comes down the mountain. He is carrying with him two tablets of stone, the Bible says, that had been written on both sides by the finger of God. God not only had made the stone, but he had also written with his own finger, these commands. And they were going to be the promise that he would elicit from his people and then he would make a promise to them that they would be the nation that he would bless, that he would be with all the rest of their lives. 
and that he would give them the promised land that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the situation. He comes down and he meets with Joshua who says, there is the sound of war in the camp. Well, that's what the sound was. But Moses said, it's not war. The Bible uses the word reverie. Reverie. Now, I don't know what word you would use. But what was happening was that the people had gone crazy. They had gone crazy. They had decided to make a calf that they could see. It was a representation of something they knew. They could see the sun rising and they were professing that this was the God who had brought them out of Egypt. That, my friends, is commonly known as blasphemy. And the, the rage that wells up inside of Moses at that moment causes him to take those stones and to throw them down on the ground and smash them. He then takes that golden calf and pitches it back into the fire, mixes it with the ashes, and causes whoever is in the neighborhood to drink that mixture, that golden calf smoothie. And then he stands up and says, Who is with the Lord? And at that moment, you have only one group of people, and I'm betting not even all of the tribe, but you have a group of men that rally to him, and they are of the tribe of Levi. They rally to him and say, we are not with that, we are with the Lord. And what happens next is kind of the, you know, kind of the R-rated piece. If it hadn't been R-rated already, this is definitely the R-rated piece because you have fratricide being dictated by Moses. He says, strap on your swords and go throughout the camp. Even if it's your father and your brother, you are to dispatch them. It's very interesting the number that are killed that day by the Levites. 3,000. And you think, that's a genocide. Yeah? But this morning, as I was listening to our lesson study, again, so well taught, I suddenly remembered another 3,000 Ten points to anybody who knows the other 3,000 in the New Testament. Can you think of another 3,000? Not that died, but were saved. Pentecost. I don't think it's a coincidence myself. But on that day, the Levites dispatched 3,000 until there was a stoppage and the people came to rest. My friends, here we stand at the threshold of this new year, and it is our opportunity to decide which promises we are going to make. The people of Israel had promised God that they would follow him and at the very first moment that they could because of a little impatience had decided that they needed someone else to follow that they could understand a little better. Promises, promises, promises. Promises, I believe, are what we have in order to run our lives. Think of that one for a moment. Every last one of us are very glad that God kept his promise this morning that he would cause the sun to come up. Amen? 
And yes, it's kind of an overcast day. It's, it's a cool day. It's a, it's a winter day in Southern California. Uh, uh, other people from further north would probably be going around in t-shirt and shorts saying, wow, this is a summer day in Northern Ontario. Eh? Happy, happy times for my friends in Canada. I know. Uh, in in uh, parts of Canada right now, it's, it's 25 below. So yes, this is a balmy day in Canada. It would be lovely. They would see the snow melt and they would be so happy. Promises are what we run our lives on. Promises to ourselves and promises to other people. There are promises, I believe, in two categories as well. Uh, Promises we can keep And promises we know we can't keep, but that we make anyway. It's a new year. It's a a time to to make these new promises. I've entitled our time together today, uh, My New Covenant. I could just as easily have said, My New Promise, or maybe My New Set of Promises. This is our turn now. Last week was God's turn to talk to us about the promises that he wants to make to us. And we found out, as I hope you did, if you were here and or if you watch it again, you'll see God makes these promises every year to us. And we can be so grateful that he does. But this, my friend, I think is the greatest promise that he makes. I'll be back. Yep. Arnie ripped off Jesus. That famous line first came out of the mouth of Jesus in John 14 where he said, I'm going to go away, but where I'm going, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and I'm going to take you back to where I am. That's a promise. We call ourselves Adventists because we believe that promise. Ever since that moment when our first parents rebelled, it was revealed that God had made himself, made himself and us a promise. The Bible says that before the foundation of the world, before he made the world, he promised that if anything should go wrong, if we were ever to be taken from him, he told us, he told himself, I'm going to come for you. I'm not going to leave you there. I will come back. Jesus kept that promise on behalf of the Godhead. He came to live with us in this thing we call the incarnation. And since he has died and gone back and is standing at the right hand of the Father, so the Bible tells us, he has left us in this sort of in-between time now between the time that he came the first time and the time that he will fulfill this promise to us of coming back again. This in-between thing. It's tough. It's tough to live in between. The theologians call it the already and the not yet. And that's the tension That's the time in which we live. This not yet part is where we have to have faith. Because it yet has not been fulfilled that Jesus has come back again. So we walk by faith. But the good news is that so far, uh, the, the account in the Bible, and I'm guessing in each one of your lives, is that God has kept all of his promises. Amen? Amen. If you have any doubt, like our first parents did, I don't know if that catches you a little off guard, but you can say amen, yes, God has kept all his promises, but Adam and Eve doubted that he would, and I dare say that each one of us have had a moment in our lives where we have doubted that God would keep his promises. 
But lest we, lest we fall into that sort of depressing thought, let's remember that, again, the Bible is the written record of God's interaction with humanity in the past, and we can look at history, and we can know that God has never not kept his promises. This is especially true for God's chosen people. Have you ever thought of this? It's not easy to be the chosen people. Have you ever wondered whether or not it would be easier if God chose somebody else? I might just be able to, you know, do whatever I wanted over here because God has chosen those people over there. It's not necessarily easy to be God's chosen people, but he has a history with his people where he is shown to never have broken his promises. It's always in God's people, his chosen people on earth, the ones that he showed his especial favor to, the ones he had and still has high hopes for. Ever thought of that? God has high hopes for. For you and for me, he did for his people in the past. He hopes that they will stay close to him and thereby show the rest of humanity what it is like to live with God in close relationship. So you see, so you see the bargaining that Moses does as he is coming down the mountain when God tells him that the people, he tells him in advance, The people down there are worshiping other gods. I am going to destroy them all. And God and and, and Moses starts bargaining with God. Have you ever done that? Are you going to be doing that again now at the beginning of 2019? Maybe you should. I don't know. God actually listened to Moses. He listened to him, and this is how it went. Uh, God, you know, you just brought them out of Egypt. And uh, uh, everybody said that that was great, but if you brought them out here to kill them on this mountain... That's not going to look very good for you, God. They're going to say, he wasn't a very good God. If you don't believe me, it's there. Exodus 32. Moses is actually telling God he's not going to look good if he kills all those people who are doing reverie down in the valley. Have you ever thought that maybe... There was a time in your life when somebody was praying for you. When you were doing reverie, when you you were out there not worshiping, but there was somebody praying for you and saying, God, don't kill them. Don't let them go. They're your people and you love them, right? You love them. You want to take them to Canaan. Don't get rid of them. Because you see, God told Moses, look, I'll get rid of them and I'm going to start over with your family. Your family will become the nation that I want to bless and I will keep my promises to. I I don't know. I don't know if I could do what Moses did. He basically stepped in front of that angry God and said, God, take me. Leave them. Take me. Kit read the piece that is the good news. Moses actually says, look, Lord, you've got to be the one to take us. You've got to be the one to take us into Canaan. If you don't go with us, we're not special. Did you hear? Did you hear kids say that? If not, read it again. Exodus 33. He's saying, God, you are the one who makes us special. Our relationship is what makes us special from all the other peoples on the earth. You have chosen us. And and if you're not with us anymore, then we're not going anywhere because we can't go anywhere and be special like we are unless you Come with us. And you can, you can read it right there. In, in, it, it, it says, God said, I'm not going with you. 
Moses had to argue with God. Had to tell him, remind him, we're only special because of our relationship with you, because of the promises that you have made for us. See, God had high hopes for his people. And his people had let him down. His people had turned away from him and had worshipped other gods. And he was ready to start over again. But Moses steps in and says, No, God. Take me. Forgive them. Forgive them. He's never broken his promises. God hasn't. Not to his children, not to his special ones, nor to those who have chosen him. Like every last one of us who is not biologically part of his chosen people, we have all chosen to be part of his family and he's accepted us in the name of Jesus into his family. So now it's the new year. It's time to consider it's time to consider what promises we will live by. The promises we make to ourselves and the promises we make to other people. You could get all political and say the social contract. How am I going to act towards other people? How how am I going to treat myself this year? Maybe, maybe that's why you decide to join the gym. Maybe that's why you decide to eat less carbs. See, see how that's all about being good to yourself and making a promise to yourself that you're going to be good to yourself and you're, you're going to feed yourself on good food so that you are healthy and strong. See, that's a promise that you're making to yourself. But then, maybe there are going to be some promises that you make about how you're going to interact with people this year. Maybe you've decided that uh, you, you, you've had a, a potty mouth in, in 2018, and you're not going to use certain words anymore to describe people because it hurts them, and it hurts you to even think those thoughts about those individuals. And it's so easy, it's so easy to use certain words because, man, it just makes you feel so good. Oh my goodness, I, I got her, or I told him, and he knows what I think now. But you promise yourself, I'm not going to treat other people that way in 2019. The depressing... Maybe even the disturbing part of, of this consideration time in which we are this morning is that, the res, is, is that the resolution process is that we we don't keep our promises. I mean, some of us are old enough that we have decided we're not even going to make any more resolutions because we know that we don't keep them. And we're saying to ourselves in a very cynical fashion, why make resolutions that I never keep? See why I chose the Exodus passage? These are the people of God. These are the people who've just been through the ten plagues and just been brought through the Red Sea on dry land. And they still can't keep their promises. We could say, we are the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have seen all kinds of prophecies fulfilled. We have been preaching about the prophecies to come. And we still can't keep our promises. We're taught, don't overpromise. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. Ever been ever been told that? If you're a business person, you've probably been told that. Don't promise more than you can deliver. And in fact, promise less, because then when you deliver more, you'll look good. But what happens, 
What happens when we treat ourselves like that? Oh, I'm not going to tell myself I'm going to the gym four times a week. I'll tell myself I'm only going two. So when I go three times a week, whoo, I'm doing great. See, under promise and over deliver. We want to reach the bar. We want to make the grade. And so we make the bar really low. We all do this. We want to keep our promises, but it's, it's really hard to keep our promises. So if we're honest with ourselves, there really isn't two categories of promises, one that we can keep and one that we can't. No, I didn't lie to you. I was just hoping that it would be true, but it's not. There's just the hope that we can try, right? So where would we be without a God a per who, who has a perfect track record of keeping his promises? Where would we be? That on the other side of this equation between us and God, he has never broken any promises. Whereas on this side, we have never kept one. We have the courage to keep making promises only because he has promised to help us. In fact, he has said he will keep our promises for us. What? Not a single amen. I'd say that's the quickest, earliest description of the grace of God in 2019 I could give you. He knows we cannot keep our promises. So he has promised that he will empower us to keep the promises that he inspires us to make. So yes, it's time to make some New Year's resolutions in 2019. And I'm going to suggest that we make those promises in cooperation with the one who has never broken any promises. And that has promised us that if we trust him, he will help us to keep the promises that he and us make together. So yes, uh, the one who brings hope puts hope back into our hearts. Hope not only for, uh, for other people and the promises that we make to them, but also the promises we make to ourselves. He has said that he will keep our promises for us. He, he says, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ. Here's how it's going to happen. He is going to put the ideas into our heads. He is also going to lead and guide us. As we, as we heard again about Elijah this morning, he will be the still small voice behind us saying, this is the path, walk in it. And the more we listen to that voice in 2019, the louder it will become and we will make choices, we will make promises based on that leadership. I will write my covenant on your heart, he says. Is your heart open this morning to God to let him take his pen and, and maybe his finger, just like he did with that first set of Ten Commandments, and write his love upon your heart so that when you make decisions, you are making decisions in concert with his heart. When you hear a voice, walk in it. Walk in the way. I say in 2019 that we should try a new way to make resolutions, a new way to make promises. Let us say, if God helps me, dot, 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 dot. If God helps me, I will. If God helps me, I promise. I'm suggesting that this, this would be the way to make real promises because they're not just backed up by people who have never really been able to keep a promise even to ourselves. They are backed up 
by the power of God. This does two things. It, it takes God at his word that he will be there for us, helping us to keep these promises we have made only by his power and, more importantly, for his glory. Because if you do it this way, please understand, if you are successful at keeping a promise this year, you will not get the credit. Are you ready for that? Because the way that I'm suggesting that we go about making promises again this year in 2019, God is going to get the credit. Okay, if you say amen to that, okay, then you're saying, let it be. This is the way I want to do it. But just remember, when it comes time to look back over 2019 and you say, wow, I didn't curse once this whole year. Oh, 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 I should say, God helped me not to curse once this whole year. Just be warned. This methodology of making a promise backed up by God means that he gets the glory. When we don't keep the promises, this is number two, we have made, we'll recognize that it was not God who didn't keep his promise. If something goes wrong and, and we don't keep the promise that we made, even though we made it with God together, just understand it's not going to be because he was the one who didn't do his part. Because he has a perfect track record of doing his part. So therefore we'll know that under these circumstances, if something goes wrong, it's probably because we were the ones who decided not to do what we said we would do in the decision-making process. 2019, let's make some new promises, okay? Let's make some new co covenants. I, I'm going to call it my new covenant with ourselves and with others. It's the only way we can live is to have these promises in our lives. Let's, let's make the promises that, that are possible only if God is our present help and strength. That when we keep those promises, we will give him the praise and the glory. I say it's because he will deserve it and we will look like his children and he will... He will be seen in us and in our congregation. So I say with all of those who have said this for thousands of years, may this be the year of our Lord, 2019. Amen. Amen.